Okay, hello and welcome to the first annual religious forum presented by the Secular Student Alliance at UGSA. I'm the Vice President of the Secular Student Alliance and I will be the moderator for tonight. Um, everyone in the group has worked really hard to make this possible. So, um, just really quick, could I get all the officers of the Secular Student Alliance to stand up really quick?
do that in our Bible studies and such. Um, just diving into the Lord. Thank you. Next up, we have. Hello. Hello, I'm Alex. I am an art major. I am also a teacher at the Singles Religious School and part of the Church of Allah. Uh, most of my answers, as you should know, Jewish student organization, will be coming from the Reform perspective, which there are many different types of Judaism, but regardless of what my perspective is, there's no single answer for any question. And we have this phrase that we love to use, which is that if you have two Jews in the room, you get three opinions. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Next we have the Muslim Student Association. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Carano. I am a senior here at the GSA and I'm also an English language arts and reading major, being my teacher sir. Um, the overarching and base belief of Islamic faith is that there is no God but God, and that the last prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is our prophet, and he serves as a human guide to life, and we follow his example as well as the creation. My name is Iman I am a political science teacher at UCSA, so I think it's law school. Uh, we wanted to preface the discussion with the uh, notion that neither Sarah nor I are the field of Jews, nor are we academics in the field of religion. Our answer is we will do our best to, to try to represent Islam in the most true way that we can, uh, but we cannot promise that. Uh, Islam is an enormous religion with over 1.6 million followers and very, many various thoughts and beliefs within those followers. And we will be giving our individual perspective for that. Uh, I ask God to forgive me for whatever we have said. Next up, we have Greek Spiritual Ground Heart, Secular Student Alliance. Hello, I'm Charles W. I'm the president of the Secular Student Alliance, and we are an organization for all agnostic, secular humanists, people who consider themselves free thinkers, or anyone who is a religious skeptic. And we are a group that basically has meetings, we have discussion topics, we basically do everything we can to basically bring people together, have you know amazing dialogue, you know, about you know church state issues, any kind of problem you know associated with separation of church and state or whatever that is. And so we try to do everything we can to basically uh, educate people about those things and also what scientific literacy as well as you know a sense of rational scientific And my name is Mark I don't know if I'm like a man in the kitchen section. Yeah, I mean, I do want to make it, so. My name is Joseph Thompson, and I'm, uh, I'm not sure if I consider myself part of the Christian Alliance, but I, I try to be able to do our divided differentiation between all of theirs, to get people out of the bubbles and then to come to events like this to see different points of view. And as for what he was saying, the Second Christian Alliance is they're all inclusive. You don't have to be an atheist or non religious to be a part of this. No secular like is just the focusing the idea of separation of church and state. So any religion is invited to that conversation. And I understand that there's those things that come across as an atheist and an organization, but it's open to all points of view for all points of discussion. That's the point of the secular is allowing everybody to the table to force their position. But not you agree on them, it's discussed later. So thank you. Next up, we have the Public Applied Spiritual Technology, or two class. Hi, my name is Tony Pickertown. I'm going to say right now, I'm going to do my best to get over shyness, talk about the subject as best as I can. So we represent the Public Applied Spiritual Technology, or CPAS. Basically, we're a group of spirits. We study ancient Indian texts. Time of the world, Vedas, documents like Bhagavad Gita, Shri Bhagavata. And basically, we cover it, we're going to be discussing these ancient philosophy, time of the world, practices of life, things like meditation, vegetarianism, to acquire these. But we're also going to be realizing a lot of science as well. We also host, if some of you don't know, our daily vegetarian lunch program. And it's really to help spread the materials. But more importantly, have all these students have a healthier option to you know, on campus. That's all they need in the portal. But to us, spirituality is a 
sight to us. The only way to speak to us is have faith in our own sight. Because without your religious belief, there's only faith. You know, science doesn't explain anything. They become sentimental, fanatic. Likewise, science, philosophy, without faith, spirituality, religion, mental speculation. So, the other would just like to share basically this ancient knowledge of how anyone, any background, any belief, have inner peace with themselves. And so, everyone in this room, for us, we're all connected and can be a person on a spiritual map. Yeah, I'm Robert Rivera, the Vice President of Love Request Vice President. Like Antonio said, we're more focused on consciousness and how we're connected. Sorry about that. Okay, now we're just going to get started with the uh, questions. Um, each group has been providing us questions beforehand. Um, so hopefully they've had a little bit of time to um, think about their responses. Um, first question, the um, questions will also be up on the projector. So the first question is, does your group believe that morality is directly tied to religion? Um, to explain on this, what does your group use to be the source of morality? Do morals change over time? How do we, and how do these changes in social norms relate to religious morality? And first group to go on this one will be the club that applies spiritual technology. Oh wait, I forgot to tell you. I am so sorry. <laughs> I am so sorry. Um, last we have the InterVarsity um, Christian College. I'm really sorry about that. Probably. Okay. I'm Jonathan Brown. I'm part of the University Christian Fellowship here at UTSA. Uh, we are a group on campus that is uh, interdenominational. What that means is that we are open and uh, welcome everybody from all backgrounds of the uh, faith and the Catholicism. Uh, and it's, uh, I want to know what we look at that uh, in Islam or Judaism. Uh, what we uh, put an emphasis on is building a relationship with Jesus Christ, and we engage that through a lot of small group Bible study, uh, through uh, exploring the Bible and Scripture together as believers, uh, knowing the fact that not only here is perfect, but that only uh, Jesus Christ is perfect, and that uh, through Him we can see eternal life. Uh, and that, uh, we are. <coughs> yeah, <that's it. coughs> Again, I apologize. Okay, so to repeat the question that we that we asked of the club um, for applying spiritual technology um, is: Does your group believe that morality is directly tied to religion? What does your group view to be the source of morality? Do morals change over time? And how do changes in social norms relate to religious morality? And maybe. I'm trying to do this in 30 seconds. Basically, because morality has to come from supreme, and absolute, divine souls. That doesn't necessarily mean a religious organization. It literally means God, or the source of all creation. Because if morality is not absolute, then it's subjected to change, speculation, the time. Days where one day, Everyone agrees that killing babies is bad, then a thousand years later, people all of a sudden agree that killing babies is okay. It's a crisis. Okay. You have to have that divine source, always becomes speculation and handful of people. Should be dangerous. Basically, basically, we take more sense of morality than the divine being God, because um, you think any of us could be able to define morality on our own. We have very limited minds and to try and find something to draw in morality is impossible for local creatures like us. That's why we have to stay in touch with the spring so we understand what is right and what is wrong. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to go down this way so each group has a chance to go first and last. So next up we have uh, Methodist. Uh, I'm very sorry. No, it's really good. Uh, so for our, for 
brings the earth for our religion, for the Methodist Church, we believe that um, we follow Jesus as the top notch form. He is our example. Um, now, whenever you look into does morality change, um, considering that we believe that we are born into sin, um, morality has changed once we accept Christ into our life and use the practices of Jesus. Um, and then the social norms um, kind of just ties in. I mean, um, moral, what is moral? You look at good and bad, but um, Next, we have the Amateur Varsity Christian Fellowship. Uh, yes, we do believe that morality is tied to God. He is the direct source of how we determine what we do in the world. We believe that God's morals and truth do not change as time progresses, and that we can seek Him in time to question. Without rooting in God's dependent truth, we can only set artificial standards for ourselves based on just subjective assessments of what is considered to be good or bad. Morality, Reality of being a follower of Christ is not to be a good person. In fact, it is impossible to be good on our own. Rather, Christianity is about grace and redemption that we found in Jesus. Thank you. Next, we have the Latter day Saints Student Association. We believe that morality comes from God. Uh, we all, as children of our Heavenly Father, are given basic senses of what is right and wrong. You know, things like murder and death, you know, we all, all know to be wrong no matter what it is we are. Our Heavenly Father uh, has given us those beliefs of this innate knowledge, and we call that the life of Christ, and it does not change over time. Uh, changes in social norms can sometimes be seen as mankind's way of reasoning or rationalizing the breaking from moral values on a large scale. Uh, one of our church leaders, Russell and Nelson, said in April that public opinion polls should not be used as grounds to justify disobedience to God's commandments. Even if everyone is doing it, wrong is never right. Evil, error, and darkness will never be true, even in popular. Um, I also just wanted to add um, that we believe that everything that is good comes from God, and it doesn't matter who you are, and it doesn't matter what you believe. Um, any goodness that's within you comes from God. And so I just, I wanted to share a scripture from the Book of Mormon, when it says, But behold, that which is of God, inviteth and enticeth to do good continually. Wherefore, everything which inviteth and enticeth to do good, and to love God, and to serve Him, is inspired of God. Next up, we have the love. You do not have to be a moral or a good person. Uh, I mean, you do not have to be Jewish to be a moral or a good person. <laughs> is that, um, what I mean by that is that God has commanded the people of Israel, the Jews, to fulfill and spoke. These are just commandments for us. We do not hold the same laws to other nations or what we refer to as Goya, uh, which is one of the things that just means other nations. Uh, Needs love can be fulfilled by anyone, and the goodness is based on three things charity, justice, and loving kindness. Even in our ideas of an afterlife, which there are a few mentions of in the Old Testament and within Jewish texts, is that you do not have to be a Jew to be a person or to go to heaven, or the world to come for whatever that may mean to you. Um, I find that my prophets and my Jews have led me to a more moral and uh, a more moral and spiritual life through Sadaka and through Sadaka means justice or charity, but also to the law, which means to repair the world, that is every person has a duty to fix the world that we have broken ourselves. So basically, as far as morality is concerned, we believe that morality can be driven you know, without religious context. We don't believe that you have to follow the uh, mandates or the dogma, rather, of a religious faith in order to be you know, moral in any sense. Uh, there are many societies that have actually, that are actually more secular, more, uh, you know, have more atheists, more agnostics, for whatever, that are actually you know, 
show the science of morality that there are other people too are greater than their own. And it can be measured in such a way just like less people in jail, less people, you know, being, uh, you know, picked up or, you know, prosecuted for basically because of uh, violent crimes or any such matter. So morality doesn't have to be derived from religion, but, uh, you know, we basically view that morality is voluntary, basically, treating other people as we wish to be treated. Uh, showing our common human, you know, nature in the sense of, you know, building other people up, compassion, and volunteerism, etc. And so, uh, it's all centered around respect and compassion. And so basically, philosophers throughout history basically have contributed all kinds of thoughts towards, you know, you know, treating people, you know, like vulnerable, treating others as you wish to be treated. Basically, that's, that thought has been around for, you know, thousands of years that ancient philosophers have definitely contributed to that such and so, anyways, that comes from other cultures like ancient Greek, Indian, Hebrew, Chinese, uh, etc. And so, morality does not necessarily have to come from religion. Thank you. Next up, we have the Muslim Super Association. Um, our simple answer to that would be no. And the example for that is that there are many people that practice religion around the world, uh, and there are many bad people that practice religion around the world, and good people that practice religion. Uh, I think so to directly tie the institution of religion to morality makes that inherent mistake that whoever commits to religion is going to be moral. We see examples of that every day, whether they be people who claim to be Muslims and do bad things, or just yesterday night when the man at FSU who shot up the school and he claimed to be a Christian. These guys, no matter what you think of them, claim to have direct ties to religion and that do not reflect in their morality. Uh, however, what we do believe is that we practice our own religion to its maximum capacity, and that's the word of the Quran, following the example of the Prophet. We can maximize the morality and character, and that we can go beyond what the normal standard is and what's considered being good. Beyond just being greedy and not harming innocent people and examples like that, uh, we'd like to think that Islam allows us to provide for us the example to try to maximize who we are as human beings. Also, just to add on to that, um, we do believe that everything stems from the Creator because He made everything essentially, and so morality comes from Him. Essentially, before organized religion, before Islam, before any of these religions, the typical name and a label, right? You have human beings who follow basic commandments of, you know, don't be a douchebag, you know, simple things like that. <laughs> you know, be a good person, don't eat this, this, this. This is way before organized religion. So inherently, human beings, at least in our eyes, are not born into sin. So we have free will. We can choose what is right, what is right, and what is wrong. And essentially, we're open to accountability for that. Next up, we have the Next question is, what is your group's view on separation of church and state? The relations between religious influence and state power have been controversial. Where does your group stand on top? To what degree should religion intermingle with state affairs and the um, group start this one is sector two All right, I got this. I'm trade off. As for religious influence, uh, state power is a virtual word for the same topic. Well, of course, the concepts and how can the separation of church and state and then and so the government can pass on to the community to change one or the other, given special privilege. Just because we have this war on Christmas that's <laughs> coming up, that's part of already. Just because something's been in tradition of a practice still doesn't make it legally correct. Same thing about the Ten Commandments down to your government building. If you want to do private property, that's fine, but the government should represent the people as a whole, not a specific tradition. And any individual. Of course you can. Because people <coughs> seem to derive their identities and their moral boundaries based on their worldviews, even secular their their So you can't have it seem like it's secular too. But once your argument for why something should come into law is based on because my favorite law says so, that's not an argument that's rational to be discussed. If you come to the table saying, I don't believe gay people should get married because of this logical process that I've come to this conclusion with, 
then I can be allowed to have a discussion. But if it's only just the mom said so, that's you're welcome to change your position. Your position that should be created as an example of why that should be. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Right, so I was really happy to see this question on here um, because there's this irrational fear of uh, Islam in this country, not by everybody, but it's largely portrayed in the media and even within government as they try to pass laws to prevent Sharia law from coming into our modern day lives. Um, we find it pretty funny. I mean, honestly, the average Muslim just looks at that and rolls their eyes. Uh, you know, our answer would be very similar to yours. We have a very diverse group in this country. There's over 300 million people that live in the United States. Within this room of 60, 70 people, there's at least six different faith groups. To subject any of them to one particular faith would be heinous in, in, in practice. What I do believe, however, is that individuals should be allowed to govern according to specific religion or religious beliefs. For example, if you have a divorce between two consenting Muslims and they choose to want to practice the after of the divorce, whether it be the splitting of children and income or property or things like that, and they both consent as a vote in this country to adhere by the Islamic law, of course they should be allowed to do that because it's not affecting other people. But any laws that affect the group as a whole should be, uh, I think I'd say this word, secular. Um, <laughs> nature, obviously, diverse groups of people can't be governed under one broad brush. Come into the government, they're going to um, you know, make everybody go under these harsh laws that are essentially bad for them. Well, it's actually an overreaction to what religions really are. Essentially, the simple rules that we have are actually better than the hand, it goes better us, right? So if it's better for the whole, then it should be accepted, right? Not just because it's Muslim or not. For example, we all saw the halal butter turkey stuff, and Mandela was going all over the. Anyway, so if it's better for the group, you know, you should do it. It's better for everybody to go for it. But not the front. Just like that. Next, we have the public question. Okay. Hey, to my Most people don't like the idea of church and state mixing together for fear of one particular religion dominating politics and how people should live their lives. That's not necessarily what we don't believe that like, your church and state should merge together and form something like a theocracy. Lord knows, I think it commands these higher lows. But we believe that, you know, some, not necessarily just that, that morality should be present in politics. You know, you know it's some form of religious belief should be in politics to, to inspire you know, governments to do good works to the its own people. Like good works, like things like that. Uh, like say, like religion is very important to help inspire like, excessively wealthy people, not necessarily to give more taxes, but give more to charity to the needed, you know, heaven, or to make like industrious corporations be more responsible to the environment. If it's ours, we have to share it, we can't let someone do it for profit. Or like inspire the government to like, give, like, make more dignified jobs for young people. So no one's stuck working at McDonald's all week to stay in college. Or better yet, the start of government for the sake of young people like us, invest more in education so that college is more affordable. So that no one at the four years of hard study starts their graduation yet. Those are the types of good works I'd like to see them religion and politics go together on. Not ridiculous things like that, abolishing. Uh, expression marriage, gay marriage, abortion, sex ed, teaching evolution, which I've seen Western versions do many times. And that's all awesome. <laughs> um, Next we have um, at the studio. I'm going to get this right one of these guys. Thank you.
university exitoso. So before I answer this question, I want you to all know that this is a question that uh, will have a very good answer in the Christian community, and, uh, also among the university as well. Uh, so I'm going to provide my personal uh, stance on this. I believe that no government can force the belief or religion upon a nation, because that, in my opinion, actually would not be a genuine way to be a follower of Jesus. Can the church and state be separated? I believe it can. Different leaders have different beliefs, ideals, and morals. And they bring them to the table of politics to make decisions on behalf of the people. I believe, though, as a Christian, that we are responsible for electing the leaders that we bring honor and glory to God. Next, we have the Latter-day Saints Student Association. And this is something that is pretty dear to my heart. Um, we do very strongly that church and government should be respectful to each other, but also very distant. Um, a, a government cannot properly represent everyone um, that caters too much to, to one religion. And we understand that everyone has the right to believe what they believe or not believe what they don't believe. Um, at the same time, um, we believe that the government should, should um, okay, so beyond the government being respectful of everyone's faith, we believe that as, as Christians and as Latter-day Saints, that we are also respectful of the government the laws of the government, regardless of whether or not we necessarily believe in that law, we will always uphold those things. Just to add on to that, um, some scriptures that we have uh, regarding this is uh, we believe that all men are bound to sustain and uphold the respective governments in which they reside while protected in their inherent and inalienable rights by the laws of such governments, and that sedition and rebellion are on becoming every citizen thus protected and should be punished accordingly. And that all governments have a right to an access laws as in their own judgments are best calculated to secure the public interest at the same time, however, holding sacred the freedom of conscience. Uh, we also believe, or we also do not believe that human law has a right to interfere in prescribing rules of worship to bind the consciences of men or dictate forms for public or private devotion, that the civil magistrate should restrain crime but never control conscience should punish the old, but never suppress the freedom of the soul. That's not these to be at the level. Um, of course, uh, the separation of church and state is essential for democracy to function appropriately. That pluralism and respect for the individual uh, is the only way that peace can ever be sustained. And not just here, but abroad. And I'm very happy to uh, see that there's uh, on this table. Uh, because as a Jewish person of a history, um, our cultural history of being oppressed from one country to the next and finally coming to America where we can practice our religious beliefs, but only to an extent there are still laws that exist that violate our religious beliefs, such as bans and same sex marriage. Um, people introducing bans on certain Practices such as circumcision, uh, things like that. Of course, when you have bans that affect actions that are essential to a religious community, then you are inherently mixing church and state. Um, next question to be starting will be the University Christian Fellowship. And the question is, what are your groups' views on the afterlife? Different religions have a wide variety of conceptions of what happens after death. How does your group visualize the afterlife, and how does your conception of the afterlife affect your everyday actions? University believes that the afterlife is one where death is not existent. There will be no more fear, hunger, pain, tears, war, sorrow, sickness, or suffering. All things in this world are brought to God and records of them in the afterlife of Christianity, which, in that case, affects how we live our daily lives according to His will and honoring Him in all that we do. Next, we have the Library of the Saints Association. Start by saying this is a full answer, really requires more than nine seconds, but uh, to summarize, uh, we believe after we die, uh, we go into what's called the spirit world, which is actually on this earth, and you're 
you're either divided into spirit paradise where those who have gone through things like baptism and such are able to continue working and uh, and, and doing things that are uh, part of our religion like you know, missionary work and other eternal things. Whereas people who haven't gone through baptism and other things that are required for our eternal progression are in something called spirit prison where they're their body, their bodies are taken from them, and so their spirit remains, but it's still attracted to, and sometimes even addicted to things in this life, like drugs or alcohol. And so, because they can't experience those things in their their bodies, they are enslaved by those, but unable to participate in them. So their spiritual progression is halted. After, and so that's why we do mission work, where we do missionary work and temple work, because we believe that the soul or the spirit continues after this life, and that you can. You can have eternal progression even after the death. And after we are judged, we will go into one of three levels of basically uh, glory. The highest being the highest level of heaven, and then there are other levels of glory. And then hell, as most people see it, is a very difficult place to get into. So, not a person. Thanks, Jeff. Hello. Hello. There is very little mention of afterlife in the Old Testament. Um, there are only a few passing phrases that mention what's being described as the world beyond, and there is another passage that describes Sheol, which is actually a Canaanite afterlife and does not pertain to uh, Judaism as we know today. Uh, because of this, there is no consensus within the Jewish community of what happens when we die. And I think that's extremely important because in order to do good deeds, you must be alive. <laughs> so we cannot fulfill in this vote the things that God has asked us to do um, if you're dead. So um, one of the things that uh, I was taught actually by Papa Rabbi, who is, uh, they are going to be very literal, very conservative in their interpretations, but also integrated in school poetry, is that if anyone tells you that they know what happens when you die, they're lying. Uh, and that goes for any Jewish person because it's fake and it's also not important to the Jewish faith. Personally, as an atheist, obviously, I don't believe in any form of an afterlife. I believe that basically, uh, once you pass away, you cease to exist, but that should actually give us. You know, basically an incentive or a motivation to try to live you know, a full life here and now while we have it, you know, doing things that we like to do, uh, enjoying hobbies, you know, enjoying the presence of friends, uh, family, uh, doing everything possible to basically you know, just enjoy our lives. And it's the only chance to really be able to do that. And so we want to do everything we can just to maximize our you know, livelihood and quality of life. Okay. To uh, take up on that. I don't know, and I think that's a perfectly valid answer. And since I don't know, I have to live this life as if, but what I do know that I exist here in my actions make a difference to me. If I live on forever, great, it sounds painful to me, but not to be productive. I prefer to be finding my immortality through the memories of people that I love. That's my plan. Next, you have the Muslim Student Association. Oh, really? Sure. I'm not. I was ahead of my head down on the way to Islam, we do believe in a heaven and a hell. Um, uh, unlike the Old Testament, it's very explicitly mentioned. Uh, heaven and hell are a way of, uh, that people are held accountable for their actions and their intentions in this life, whether they be private or public, good and bad, uh, they're measured. Uh, we also believe that regardless of how someone might be perceived by other human beings, it is not us, up to us to judge anybody. We don't know the background of anybody. We don't know where they're coming from and what their intentions are in this real life. Uh, we also certainly don't believe that our uh, our journey to heaven has any limitations on our enjoyment of this life. Uh, we certainly have the ability to live this life to the maximum capacity and to try to affect the people around us and try to make this world a better place than it was before we got here. Uh, just to answer like, the last question, um, and the part of that, um, how does it affect our daily actions? 
It just does. I mean, all, all of our actions are just to plead, you know, the Lord, in His mercy, right? Then heaven or hell is our ultimate destination. So everything we do, we're going to be held accountable for, whether it's good or bad, we're subject to that. Also, people don't understand that within religions, an afterlife provides a sort of comfort and recompense so that the people who are treated unjustly in this life will be treated justly by a God who is just. Basically, I'm going to believe in karmic reaction and reincarnation. Basically, karma here, very, I'm just going to say, it just goes around and comes around. Punch someone in the face unjustly, someone in the future is going to punch back in the face justly. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea of reincarnation is very much the type of science today. Basically, scientists would say, you see, there's nothing is created and destroyed. So there's these bodies who fill up the vision, who fills up what powers these bodies, the souls, the identity. Recognize itself. Basically, for us, there isn't that much of an afterlife because just life doesn't really end. It's constantly changing. Birth, disease, old age, death, and through all these processes of different bodies, even in different species. To us, basically, we use high consciousness and spirituality to escape karma reaction, to escape reincarnation, we just go back to God and escape it all the time. And I know much of your this here may not agree with this idea of karma reaction and reincarnation. We all agree on that we're all out of the same thing as to be with God. And the other thing is, um, you know, we're not these bodies, you know, and once you, the idea of death, once you die, you know, your soul leaves this vehicle, you know, your body stops functioning, but your soul is still, you know, active, and consciousness never dies. So, to describe what death would be is, you know, you, you set it up in your car and you go to a different vehicle. So, you know, this is just vehicles that we're experiencing what we call perceived human life as and any other, you know, forms of life that can be taken up. I mean, if, you know, I can't remember whether I'm almost five years old, so how could I ever remember why I did a previous life or, you know, whether there's a possibility that we could experience life like past this, you know, this, this world, you know, this one planet, an infinite you know, universe with a bigger multiverse. Do you have a soul? You are the soul. So, <laughs> okay, um, and last but not least, the uh, student group. I told you, you right? Uh, we do believe also in eternal life and heaven or hell, uh, depending on uh, how it goes. But uh, the keys to getting to heaven that we believe are living a life in Christ. Accepting Christ into your life, meaning accepting Christ into your life, um, that He came to the earth to take away your sins. Um, that is the key for getting into heaven that we believe. Um, also, um, um, meeting heaven, also meeting a place of no pain, no sorrow, just happy place. Next question. If you're going to go to the group that will start the next question is hello. The um, question is How does your group incorporate traditional religious beliefs in the modern world? Unique challenges are believed to be an issue to traditional religions in the modern world. Science can be viewed as threatening to certain religious conceptions of the universe, and new ideals and values may challenge traditional beliefs. How does your group learn the religion of the dirty? That's a pretty big question. <laughs> and um, we cannot move forward with the world that we want to create by living in the past. So in order to perform to the law and prepare the world, you would have to apply the things that you believe. Our texts, our prophets, our writings, our poetry, everything must meet the demands of the era. Uh, and that can come in many different ways. Part of one of the youngest strangers, the biggest strangers of Judaism, people from Judaism, has used our laws and our writings to meet things such as the uh, abortion or same sex marriage. We have to use this to, to confront that. And we cannot do that by viewing things the same way that they did 2,000 years ago, because their world has changed and we live in a home. And I cannot see the world with the eyes of consciousness. Next up is second two lines. Okay, so science is not religion, it's a thought process. process. It's how we, the best way to be able to walk inside. On how 
to determine whether or not something is true and plausible for what they have in the feelings. So that's it. Yeah. And that's all it is. So you can look at the data and come to the conclusion to interpret what happened. I mean, the sectors and allows everybody to the table to come and have that discussion and then you come back and figure out to build the whole system as well. Because if you're arbitrarily taking bigger bars around me, then that's for the existence of human beings. And that becomes your arbitrary bar that you picked. Now, with that arbitrary bar, you now have things that are non arbitrary, such as burning people is a bad thing based on that arbitrary rule that does seem to be done. And through that scientific process of determining that they burn people is bad, you now have to look at the etymology of their involvement in this process and try to particularly discuss what happens once you implement these rules. You can start finding out where the groups are falling through the cracks. And if one group is starting to decline because they now have to share their bags and oranges with another group that they didn't get access to the oranges, you can see where some of their already start falling apart. But as long as you're having a conversation, the more problems will gain their quality and we can start to fix the problems. So we can just speak up a little bit next time. I know, I got a sore throat. Okay, so we have the Associate Association. Um, upon reading this question, uh, am I talking about it? I'm good, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> upon reading this question, I might have taken it a little offensively. Uh, it's rooted in the false pretense that all religions have scripture that conflict with modern science and the modern world. My religion is me praying five times a day, uh, me fasting 30 days throughout the year and other slug days, being good to people, whether they be rich, poor, black, or white, and of other religions, and uh, that's pretty much the extent of it, and believing in God and, uh, and Muhammad as his messenger. How that would conflict with modern science and the modern world, I'm not sure. Um, Islam is the void of text that would uh, conflict with the with modern science. For example, uh, the example of heliocentric solar system is present within the Quran that might be contradicted within other scriptures. We don't have to deal with that. Um, so my very simple answer uh, to condense that is uh, it's not a problem. Well, also, I should say the same thing. That question is not like, I'm assuming that just because we're looking at it in a primitive time means that it's a primitive thing and it's not applicable for the rest of humanity. At least from our faith, that's actually very applicable as much as saying there are basic things that we can follow any time period. And for the gray areas in our faith, we have scholars that continue to study the religion to be able to answer these questions for us. Next up, we have Sikas. Okay, I don't think the ancient days don't like a lot of models of modern science. Okay, the fact that the people today still practice the same exact same religious principles, spiritual principles that practiced about 4,000 years ago kind of gives some credibility to it. But even the greatest itself, we talk a lot about science, for instance, the reference that. The universe is in it, but it's also expanding and contracting at the same time. Now, these are the religions. Okay, I'm going to make the. Uh, what we're trying to say to them is yeah, we're more focused on spiritual knowledge rather than a religious belief system. A belief is simply the proposition you think is true. We you don't, know, you know, practicing Christian consciousness will make you a better Christian, will make you a better Muslim, will make you a better Jew, will make you a better woman. It's more about you connecting your consciousness, your soul with the spirit. Okay, so we have the United Methodist Student Movement. When looking at it, uh, traditional religious beliefs, uh, the thing that comes to my mind is baptism. Uh, baptism, accepting one's faith, uh, being more than to it. Uh, you look at uh, different types of baptisms in the different denominations of churches. You have the sprinkling of water, which is what the Methodists like to do, it's like the sprinkle, and then uh, in uh, like the Baptist churches typically do similar. But um, it all means the same thing to us. Um, I think the challenge really not necessarily the um, what like how are we doing it, it's just like why are we doing it? But then at the end of the day, it's just what you believe in. Like I said, the challenge is just um, believing in something that you can't 
see, but that's just plus it does. Next we have the University of Christian Fellowship. We accept the modern world of the sun to the truth of Jesus in our lives. We are able to see uh, what the modern world is with the modern God's truth and what is not. That comes from prayer and community and seeing how uh, as a whole and finding what the world is in the of God and what is not. But we are here in this world because of that also some whether it's you or not. Uh, the end product of it is representative of his truth. Uh, the church is always looking to be relevant in modern times, but we cannot simply just accept modernism without question. Next, we have the Latter day Saints Student Association. In the Gospel of Jesus Christ, there are some absolutes, there are some commandments, there are some teachings that, um, regardless of whether or not they are cool or hip right now, they are true. And, and we do. We live by them and we love them. That having been said, that still leaves you um, with a, um, the ability to, to pursue so many different ideas and cultures. And, and uh, I, I, of course, I'm a scientist, and, and I, I take with it everything that comes with being a scientist, and even the way scientists think. And uh, uh, there's just so much heterogeneity in the church. And we just remember that the doctrines gospel and everything else, you know, we live our lives according to our conscience and everything else we need to pursue. Right, adding on to that, um, God doesn't change and scriptures, uh, one thing that we use uh, using tr uh, scriptures or traditional values in modern days is how we can, you know, not experience those same things, but utilize those stories and those principles to talk. You know, we don't have to worry about following someone as they go to park the Red Sea, and we don't have to be worried about being thrown into the lion's den for what we believe. But we can take principles and doctrines from those things. From Moses, we can take the idea of following the prophet, even if it means to something that we perceive from what we know as something that will be us skill. And from Daniel, we can take, you know, being truthful, truthful to your faith, no matter what, and that God of us. Okay, next question. <coughs> we'll be starting with. Oh, why do they sing students? So okay. The um, question is why does your group hold your beliefs to be true over other beliefs? Acknowledging the wide variety of religious beliefs, why do you believe your religion holds true over others? What well, separates your beliefs that give them greater religion than other popular doctrines? So, one thing that we believe about. Uh, truth is that it is universal, that it's not just uh, for one group to have over another, that God does dispense truth to everyone. And we believe that the fullness of the gospel of Christ has been restored, but it is not a reason for anyone to feel superior in any way to up towards other groups of God's children. Rather, it requires a greater obligation to invoke the essence of the gospel of Christ in our lives, to love, serve, and bless others. Our church leaders in 1978 issued a proclamation that said, We believe that great religious leaders of the world, such as Muhammad, Confucius, the Christianity reformers like Martin Luther, as well as philosophers including Socrates, Plato, and others, received a portion of God's life. Moral truths were given to them by God to enlighten world nations and to bring a higher level of understanding to individuals. Thus, we have respect for the sincere religious beliefs of others and appreciate others extending the same courtesy and respect for the tenets we hold dear. Thank you. Next up, we have Noel. Um, I really don't like the way this question is worded because it implies that we inherently do hold our beliefs of others, and we certainly don't. I mentioned earlier that uh, in Judaism, that we have a set of laws that are given to us to approve um, But we also have in the Talmud, which is going to be extra uh, biblical text, is that we have the Noahide laws, which are because Noah lived in a time before Judaism, but the text describes him as a righteous man. And it's because of this that there are a certain set of laws similar to what the Ten Commandments is laid out. 
that no righteous person, regardless of whether they are Jewish or not, can ever be condemned. And um, we certainly believe that there is value and something to learn from every single faith. And Tom also says that everything within God's creation is a moment for us to learn. And particularly, one of uh, the most striking things for me in my experiences was reading a text from the Bauchan Po, who is the master of Chabad, who says that we need to even respect the atheists for their unbridled compassion without promise of reward. So basically, we don't obviously subscribe to the religion because it's say we advocate for religious freedom and also freedom from religion. There are you know, many people who obviously in the agnostic atheist community who would I guess be either opposed to religion or actively you know show some disdain for religion and that obviously varies from one person to another within the agnostic atheist community. But as far as this question is concerned, we don't you know obviously hold ourselves to be above you know, anyone else. We are we came to our conclusion that we don't believe in God because of lack of scientific evidence and you know, that's done that we came to that conclusion basically due to our own independent research. And so we don't we don't basically go and say that there are ways the right way to just choose to disbelieve because of the lack of scientific evidence. And so we obviously began advocating for religious freedom and uh, stand up again for uh, scientific and rational thought and basically stand up to superstition and wisdom, etc. Yeah. All right, so we're going to, all right. And another point on that is we will turn on a dime if the evidence is presented to us in a viable scientific way that can be falsifiable. We were open to cheating 100% like if you and I said I don't know what's gonna happen for God, but if you show me, I will now cooperate with that. If you show me a tree, I cannot not believe that, that tree is not there based on what you present to me. I that not be incorporated into my understanding of the natural world. Next up we have the Public Student Association. Um I, I think that I mean, I, I think it's okay to say obviously that we don't hold ourselves in the arrogance over other religions, but I also do think that everybody chooses to be within the religion that they choose for a specific reason. There's a reason why I'm Muslim and I'm not Christian, and there's a reason why somebody's Christian and they're not Muslim. They are hold certain beliefs within their system that draws them towards that. And I think it's entirely individualistic, and different people are drawn to faith for different reasons. Some people that I can't deny because I don't have that. You know, experience will say, well, you know, I was praying and I saw God and He told me this. That's not true. I myself, my uh, my belief in God or my belief in Islam is rooted in the Quran. Uh, this God, uh, what we believe to be the uh, the literal word of God. And when I say that, I mean that there's a lot of aspects of the Quran that we that I might consider infallible or inhuman. Uh, from the linguistic beauty of the Qur'an that we see as not being able to be matched by man, uh, to some of the historical allusions in the Qur'an that made references to things that, we, that weren't discovered for hundreds of years later, and to scientific things even, like I alluded to earlier, whether it be the heliocentric nature of the universe that was talked about in the Qur'an, uh, amongst other things. So this is what I believe. I believe that the Qur'an, in the way that it provides, has enough evidence for to draw me to Islam, uh, as opposed to other religions and other beliefs in the Qur'an. With all due respect, and of course, thanks to Jesus Christ for all these things. Shout out to I found this question very uh, personal, but in a good way. Um, I think it's relative to the person whether they choose to practice something or not, and if that's your choice. Um, I have found that I am in need, in need of a guide to life, you know, because there is a, uh, Islam is not just a religion, but it serves as a guide to life, um, teaching me how to clean myself, to you know, how to pray, and do all these different things. Um, I have done my research about other faiths just to be more inclusive and know, you know, what the differences are. And sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> and we have sea vessels. We do not think ourselves superior to anyone. When you say God conscious human beings, we should not think ourselves greater than anything. Now all these are religious beliefs. They have their differences, but to us, they're all external religious beliefs. Deep down, every person, every religious person, has to do the same thing. We 
intelligent and spiritual mind person with a look at the similarities between religions. We have to see the more people are trying to go back to God. A bigger person will only focus on the differences between religious beliefs. Thus, there's chaos. I kind of a parable. To know that a rubber ball dropped on a Tuesday and wagon called by a red headed tuba player will fall to the ground. I don't need, I don't need a sample that includes a tuba player dropping rubber balls at this location. Similarly, one does not need to experience the contingent cosmos know that it is caused. So that they're doing the cause, that cause the cause, that cause the cause, that cause the cause. Basically, everything comes from God. All these religions all come from the same person who's no person going back to God. You know, even though there's all these differences, if you look at the world itself, it's diverse. Okay, God of all the beings in existence love diversity. Look at this room. Everyone here has a different face, a different voice, a different name, a different thought, and even a different belief. There can still be unity in the world, even with these differences. And that's unity by diversity. I think that's something that we please God immensely. So no, I don't favor any particular faith over another. As long as it was going to for the same purpose. To me, God is everywhere. Everywhere. In everyone's heart, he's in every single yeah, church. church. <laughs> he's boss, I'm sorry. He's everywhere. He loves you. I'm sorry, I don't know what I said, but. <laughs> um, okay, now, um, before we start the next question, I'd like us just to go around and read this next question. Go ahead. No. <laughs> 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 I thought I wouldn't do it again, but um, in your parts of the Christian culture. So, what's really cool about it, Carson, is since we are a Christian non-relational fellowship, we do see all these different beliefs, uh, people who have come with questions about Jesus and who he is. Uh, and we acknowledge that. We see that the truth of Jesus Christ holds uh, true over others, just you know, uh, just the culture that that he brings through how this entire world of just different believers. Uh, we just we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, we believe in his authority and uh, in, in his authority and by his belief in faith in him alone in our lives. Uh, we see that through uh, just uh, the blessing that he provides us, the, the grace that he gives us when we fall short. Uh, I myself have seen Jesus moving around in life, genuinely experiencing can only be described as a supernatural and only something that can come from Jesus. Now we want to ask questions. Um, I had it down and I didn't let it close. <laughs> okay, so next question, during this question, I'd like to uh, just go around and collect the um, no cards for anybody who has any more questions. Um, all the questions are um, So it's kind of nice. Um, the group that will be starting this one will be the Muslim Student Association. Um, the question it is a kind of loaded topic. Um, what is your group's view on non heterosexuality and gay marriage? The topic of gay marriage and non heterosexuality is frequently tied to religion. That being the case, where does your group stand on that? Uh, so, obviously, um, marriage is a government institution, it's regulated by governments. Uh, Actually, I'm a therapist, but that's relevant to this. Um, uh, I, I don't think that the government should have a role in marriage, but that's since I do think it does, uh, as a result of the diverse society we live in, I don't think they have the right to regulate the marriage, and that's a simple thing. Just to add on to that, um, just from, just, you know, based on the religion, although in Islam we do not, you know, don't really uh, allow you know, same-sex marriage in our faith. We don't agree with that. However, of course, we have to respect other people for what they believe. I just would not agree with that. Also, in our faith, we, we, you know, we uh, believe that God gives us you know, rules, but not just for nothing. You know, there's reasons behind rules, so we're not just you know, agree with that for no reason. We believe there's reasons for it. Perspective, from my perspective, 
marriage, you, know, you can't be selfish when you marry someone. You can't go to someone and say, I'm married you because you look good. Or I'm married you because you have a lot of money. Because it's based on selfishness. And once a selfish desire can't be satisfied anymore, marriage fails. In fact, as you see this in marriage alone, divorces, one or two marriages, divorce. Two guys are happy with each other, that, that man is another man who is going to have to imagine that, you know, frown upon me. I've, I've grown up with gay people around me, and there are great people who are really happy people. I mean, it's kind of just, you know, how the culture is in this country. It's just kind of, there's a stigma to it. You know, wow. But, one story is that if God didn't want homosexuals to exist, it would make it very obvious. Because there wouldn't be any homosexuals. We believe that God's design is heterosexuality. We believe that it is not the church's role, though, to perpetuate hate in this gay marriage, but rather a response to healing. Jesus did not come to condemn this world, nor homosexuality, nor gay marriage, but he rather came to redeem this through him. I'm very grateful for that last response because I, I feel that a lot of things who that's all short in expressing their opinions with the appropriate amount of respect and compassion and love that all children of God deserve. Um, that having been said, I had mentioned before that God has made laws and, and there are things that we as human beings can't change. And so we believe that marriage is not an institution of man, it's not a government institution, it's something that God has, has established. And that he has, that marriage between man and woman is the name of God. And it's central to, to God's plan for our eternal destiny as his children. On that having been said, um, you know, as a church, we have openly advocated for rights of same-sex couples, um, for housing equality, um, hospitalization rights, employment rights, all such things where if they don't infringe upon our religion's right to, to practice what we believe to be marriage between men and women. We believe in respecting and loving all people. That being attracted to someone of the same sex is not a sin, and it does not condemn you, and it does not make you any less loved by our Father in heaven. Next up is Will. Um, so, to start with, uh, lots of people love to famously quote the Davis. Uh, of course, they never read it in Hebrew, and <laughs> I, I have, of course, as part of church education, so I think it's memorized the Torah. But um, in Hebrew, for the infamous passage, the verbiage that's used for man lying with another man and woman with another woman only refers to rape. It's the verb that is only ever used in terms of sexual assault and aggression, and which you shame or suffocate another human being. With that in mind, uh, modern Judaism sees it as a non-issue. In fact, because the text mentions subjugation, robbing someone of their dignity to deny someone their right to marry whomever they choose, robs them of their dignity, which is something that Judaism historically has tried itself to uphold is the dignity of each individual. Uh, furthermore, <laughs> in our text, also in Hebrew, uh, the souls are referred to as neshima, which is a feminine word, but is also sexless, and also relates to that fear of us who in the broken world uh, must find each other, regardless of what bodies uh, we need to examine. Thank you. Next up is as I said. Let's well, basically, as an atheist and secular humanist, I believe that it's <laughs> very important for everybody to be able to love who they want to, express their uh, feelings, emotions, uh, and basically develop a long-lasting relationship regardless if it's man and man, woman and woman, or whatever. You know, I take a libertarian stance that whatever you know, people do that you know, basically makes them happy, they should be able to do it as long as they're not basically resulting in harm from any other person you know, doing what they want to do, as long as you're not basically 
basically taking away the, the rights and liberties to someone else or harming them either physically or psychologically. And so I believe that it's important for us to protect you know, the rights of you know, people in the LGBT community and you know, not actively, you know, not just us, but anyone, no government, no religion should actively try to prevent them from having their you know, rights to marry and live you know, long, happy, prosperous lives together. And so we believe that they should be able to do what they want to do so long as it doesn't bring upon, doesn't bring upon themselves or anyone else harm. A quick follow up on this is that this is a question that's been studied by social scientists. They, they've done a study to look at the well being of the bars of children's welfare that children raised in a two parent household come out just fine. It doesn't say two male, two female, male or female, cis two parents. So there are certain social questions that we still struggle with because we haven't figured out how to study them accurately. But this one we can't. So your position on this, according to my point of view, doesn't matter. Because we can study this and come to a conclusion and then move on to the next problem we solve. Sorry, that's the message. Okay. Um, so for the next part, um, uh, I don't think we decided on that amount of time for questions. Should we give them 45 seconds? Okay, so in terms of a generalized question, we'll give 45 seconds to each group. Um, in terms of a question that's directed at a specific group, um, we will allow for 90 seconds. So, um, so how we're going to do this is we're going to have one question from the card, and then we're going to do one question from the other. So to start with, we'll do one question from Nakar. Um, oh wow, okay. So, modern gender equality movements are focused on allowing men and women to do the same things and have the same opportunities. Does your worldview or religion allow women to do the same things men can do? I mean, does the modern idea of gender, gender equality fit with your worldview or religion? I guess we we'll just start on the left over here with um, the university of Michigan. So, in terms of that question, it sounds as a little question. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, we do believe that men and women can do uh, things that they are called to. They can, they can do careers, they can do similar careers, they can do similar roles. God did design, however, things fit for man and fit for woman. As a, as a man cannot uh, aid a child, for example, uh, as a mother would, uh, in the same sense where a mother could not aid a child in the sense that a man could. So yes, there is equality in certain terms on else, but uh, in terms of design, there are some things that are just good for man and good for woman. Next up is uh, Association. I'm with the gender is actually essential. Our eternal existence. And so, no, I don't believe that men and women are the same, but we definitely are equal. And as a woman um, who belongs to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints, I never felt like my wings were clipped. I never felt like I hadn't had the opportunity to teach and to serve and to do all those things that, that Christ asks of, of his children. And so, I, I feel actually extremely liberated. Um, by this faith that lets me know that I'm a daughter of God. Um, he has sons and daughters who he is made different, who he loves equally. And so we have a will. Um, it's easy to answer this question with the fact that at my synagogue, Tom Babel, all the clergy as of right now are women. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, anybody's met me and my girlfriend. She is the alpha male. <laughs> <laughs> and if we have children, I'm saying we're going to take care of the children. And unfortunately, sometimes she gets a lot of pushback because sometimes our friends just had a child. And they immediately hand her to me, even though she was standing right next to me. Because they understand that that has a couple of children in our world. I just haven't had more of these feminine qualities, even though I have. 
basically, I don't think that there's any one worldview that should dominate the other, if I'm understanding the question, the question correctly. Um, I believe that you know, everyone has a chance to examine all the different worldviews in a marketplace of so many different ideas, so many different religions, so many different denominations or what or whatnot. And so basically it is up to each individual person to choose for themselves, you know, which religion or non-religion that they wish to follow and basically just go along with it based off of evidence that they perceive you know, to exist in, in favor of whatever faith or lack thereof that they choose go on basically. So I don't think any one faith or any one particular worldview should have any uh, necessarily any priority or you know be elevated above you know above everyone else's basically. Evidence. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Next up we have Um uh, I think uh, it is the first line so obviously this is represent us as a whole. Um, we do perceive the Quran as the word of God. However, I believe that there is inherently in each religion going to be uh, discrepancy and differences. And because there's differences, inevitably there's going to be people that are right sometimes and wrong sometimes consistently. And that would be dependent on people's translation and interpretation of different texts and things like that. And that's what it boils down to. Um, but just because, you know, you don't have all the answers, because not one person does not have all the answers, or not one faith does not have all the answers, that doesn't mean what you do have is not enough. So a faith does not need to prove to the rest of the world, you know, that we're perfect. You know, we, have, we agree with what we agree, and that's it. You know, for me, God's existence is enough to by looking at trees and looking at all of you guys. That's enough for me. And the only thing that would change, the only way I would accept my religion as flawed, is so literally that one letter in the Quran changed. Right? It's been the same for 1,400 years. Believe that. If one letter changed, I would not tell you. That's what I'm Next up, we have Sikas. First of all, can you ask a question again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm ready. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so what would you accept as evidence not to suggest that your worldview is at least in part inaccurate or flawed? Okay. What well, I was going to say is um, no one knows what you're supposed to know. Wisdom is knowing how little we know. I mean, I'm not here. We're not here to convince you of a perspective. I mean, we're here to kind of find what is, why we're we here, who are we, where are we going, you know, self-identity and self-purpose, those things that think that, you know, those are our highest needs, self-realization, self-actualization, so, I mean, I could be wrong about all of my beliefs, and that'd be, that'd be the best ever, and I could, like, you know, figure out, you know, there's some things I actually don't know, and I mean, beliefs and knowledge are things which you said here, so, we're more focused on, you know, knowledge and, you know, what is knowledge, to know something is to be absolutely certain of it. To be absolutely certain of it, it's indubitable, which is impossible to doubt. And in regards to Christian Belgium. Well, the scene of law is actually the, the, the guy who's on the microphone right now. Um, <laughs> as a believer in Jesus, uh, you are you are accepting the fact that you are, you are flawed and that your views are broken and that you are having a dependency on Jesus and, you, and him alone. For that truth and through for that uh, uh, answer um, answer to those questions that you may not be flaws in your own personal life. The way you see that is actually everyone's good saying through questions, uh, through scripture, through uh, through uh, prayer as well, and reaching out to your fellow believers in the Christian community to do this together for uh, we believe you know that God did not call us to walk in this alone, but he called us to walk in this community to Ask those hard questions to look for those answers. Okay, so next we're going to have a question from the Bible. Um, okay, so since so we started with um, letter C, we'll start with the Okay, so this one the question is What are your thoughts on the reading process? Is there one? If so, is it really needed? Could you repeat that a little louder, please? What are your thoughts on the grieving process? Is there one? And if so, is it really needed? Um, in traditional Judaism, and this is actually good when you're being asked reform, because uh, not a little, little as I am, I find comfort in, and I have been through this, is that we have seven days of mourning called Shiva, which um, 
It's, you're not allowed to get them, and that's for very pragmatic reasons, and there's always another person with you, but it's kind of morning after a close family member or friend has passed. Um, there are other traditions, such as uh, saying the Kaddish, um, which is a special prayer, one of those prayers that we have. Um, there are other things, such as you tear a piece of your clothing at the moment you learn or see someone die. You ruin your clothing that you have on you, such as a sleeve. And you wear it around your wrist as to remind yourself of their passing. Next up is the same. As far as uh, the grieving process is concerned, I've obviously experienced family deaths, and it's important for family members to be together uh, to uh, cover one another to get to such that, that such tough time. And so, obviously, you don't believe, I don't believe in any afterlife, at least based on the fact that there's uh, little so evidence that there would be an afterlife. And so I believe that it's up to friends and family to be there for each other, comfort each other, and help them get to that really challenging time. That's basically for us. Social pictures. Next up is now saying. I don't, there's no constrict, there's no constriction on the reading process or anything like that, but there is text within the Quran within uh, some of the actions of the Prophet that we follow in times of hardship. Uh, for example, a verse in the Quran that says, in the mouth of the Sea of which is an insurance from God that any time you have hardship, it will be followed by grief. And these are the kind of ways that we deal with grief. Um, it can be, you can have family for grief, you can have friends for grief, but you can also lie on your grief. Um, there are little amino willing that's how we grieve that makes sense as a community member to go visit someone's you know, funeral procession, for example. You know, friends and family go to see them get buried. That's obviously really recommended within the name. Um, in terms of like dress, you know, we don't really do all the all black things, dress appropriate, you know. Um, also within our faith, because we do rely on God to give us this ease, we're not encouraged to remain in deep sadness. It's natural to be sad, but then we need to pray for you know, the one that's passed and try to move on with our life. Next up, we have CPAS. Alright, so when it comes to grieving, when your relative and friends die, well, we, we're not attached to bodies. We identify ourselves as the, the eternal soul, which is operating this body. The soul, which is eternal and destructive. So when it's a dear friend or family member dies, it's okay to be sad, and we will miss them. But other than that, this consciousness is realized all that's really happening is that person's soul is simply connected to the body. And after all respects, they dispose of the body. It's just, it's now just a matter of matter. It's unmanageable and rotting. So just have no attachment to the body material to understand the spirit of the earth is eternal. <laughs> I mean, death in, death in this physical plane is definitely you know, initially a very hard thing I mean, for me many years of my own personal life. Uh, after my grandfather passed away, you know, it was you know, a dark feeling, but you know, to this day, you know, I still have a pinch of them. Next up, we have the University Christian Fellowship. So, we believe that grieving is actually a process uh, that is given by God. And it's a moment that it has got given emotion to have this sadness in this uh, but actually, you can see, you can see in the Bible, actually, it's actually the shortest verse in the Bible that uh, Jesus wept. Uh, this is a guy giving an emotion, and it's something that you can, uh, that you can go through. It's a process. Uh, you, you have your community there to support you. Uh, there is a uh, idea that they are there to share that with you, and to uh, walk through that with you. And uh, through the grieving process, it's also something that's a time to celebrate the person that passed, uh, celebrate their life, celebrate who they are in the midst of that, who they are in the end of Jesus. Last but not least, we have about the same student association. Uh, I agree with a lot of what's been said so far. Uh, we also we have a grieving process. Uh, it's not anything that's specified, but it is something that moves naturally to us as humans. And you know, I've had people, friends that have been very close to me that passed away, and you know, I'm sad for them, but at the same time, we also teach that families and everyone will be resurrected and live again, and that we will all be in heaven together. And so there's also a joy that can come from knowing what we know 
from the teachings of the gospel. And parents that lose a child at birth will be able to be with that child again in the afterlife. And you know, sons will be able to be with their parents, or sons and daughters will be able to see their parents again in the afterlife. And we'll all be able to be together and see each other again. Okay, so now we're going to take another question from the audience. I wanted to know all of your thoughts on sin, and when I say sin, um, I'm defining it as us continually uh, breaking God's moral law, both in thought and deed, continuously, and if sin deserves um, an eternal punish punishment, because the one whom we sin against is eternal, and coupled with that question, um, your thoughts on Jesus Christ being the sole satisfaction and payment for that sin, since he himself is eternal God. Um, I think this is more directed at uh, uh, Christian Latter day Saints groups. So, do you want to just have them respond or do you want to have them respond? It's possible that they want to respond. Okay. Um, I guess as a single start first. That makes sense the way I asked. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> we'll start the time when we're done discussing. Who's going first? You are. Oh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as uh, sin is concerned, uh, we obviously don't, you know, are not uh, bound by any particular religious faith. We, again, our moral code is treating others as, as we wish to be treated. You know, the golden rule, philosophers of uh, you know, back in the day, you know, their that was basically what their arguments were. And so um, we believe that when with, with treating people with respect and compassion, that means obviously doing no harm to them and making sure that you know, everything we do basically builds them up, you know, and wants them to be better people themselves and help them to strive to be better. And so as far as uh, sin is concerned, it just doesn't really apply to us. And I have to be, I have to disagree with the global one because it's, it's ethnocentric. It's the idea that what is good for me is good for everybody else. No, the, global, the true golden rule is treat others the way they want to be treated. Because that implies you have to go out into their circle, figure out who they are, what is important to them, and treat them with that. Sorry, that's sorry. <laughs> and I do that. <laughs> Next year, I'm say. Uh, we believe that inherently all humans do bad things, um, commit sin by that definition. Uh, sin is a very, very big thing in the Quran, and almost every time it's mentioned in the Quran, it's mentioned uh, very simply as if you ask forgiveness, you give forgiveness. Uh, for example, I literally just put up into this page that says, uh, He is most forgiving, ask God for forgiveness, He is most forgiving, most merciful for those who do bad and evil to their own souls. Um, we don't have any direct connection with Jesus. We don't believe that we need that medium to ask God for forgiveness as a direct prayer uh, for our own ways without a uh, living, breathing medium. Uh, also, uh, they just, you know, come from fundamental belief in some we do not believe that humans um, were born into original sin because, you know, logically for us, when we weren't born yet, so we couldn't put it in medicine. So that's how we believe that everything we need starts off with clean with the slate. In free will, of course, you have the option to choose good or bad, and if you don't follow God's rules, that's considered a sin. But you can always turn back and ask for forgiveness and fall to the Next up, we have CMS. Um, we hear we not perfect. God is perfect. Now, on the subject of sin, in our respect, the most sinful thing a person can do is forget about God. But if you make mistakes, Trying to redeem yourself with a lot of effort, God all of forgive you, simple and merciful. But as far as that punishment goes, committing a simple action, you know, I'll simply say, if you unjustly murder someone, then some point in your own life, you'll be murdered in return. But if you don't believe in karma or reincarnation, then my answer may not be satisfying. But still, I always understand. Feel guilt to make a bad action, you can use that guilt to make yourself a better person from striving for God's forgiveness. Next up, 
identity with each other in this similar love for God. And that's, that's all the count. Trust me, if they were telling the baby that they're going to go to hell, I'm not going to be happy and surprised that you married the first place. All about God comes is recognizing the love within everything. And they would share that same desire to do That's God's work. We do believe that marriage is the sign of God and the sign of God and is given from Him. Uh, so to marry a non-believer is outside of the realm of those uh, when we consider uh, something that is uh, by God. Uh, do you have any reason for marrying a non-believer? Yes, this of course uh, because he finds, uh, we find redemption in all, all shortcomings and all sin, uh, all that fall short of that. So, so we don't have a real distinct doctrine that, that says you, sh- you should marry someone who's not of your faith. And what we do have, um, and you may know, that members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are, are married and still in the temple, and you may see one in Stone Mountain. And we believe that marriages that are bound in that way are for time and on eternity and not until death that you part. So that's a great blessing being married in that way, that having been said, um, this is me personally, my father is not a member of my faith, and my mother is, I couldn't ask for a better father who's more loving me, more supporting me. And so there are ways when there's patience, when there is charity and kindness, and there are ways that you can make those things happen. But to have a marriage that is eternal, um, you know, in our faith, we would both be members of this faith. Next up, we have hello. Um, so the thing we're for is that it doesn't matter as long as two kids and two adults are in love and are willing to spend the rest of their lives or their foreseeable lives with each other, then there is no issue. They are allowed to participate in all functions of life in the same God and the community. However, it is different for Orthodox and conservative theism, which uh, is blatant to forbid interfaith marriages. And ultra Orthodox communities will excommunicate uh, Jews from the community who uh, have relationships with those who are not Jewish. Um, but of course, if I have something else, who cares? <laughs> if you're not, you're not. <laughs> Basically, uh, interfaith relationships, uh, though they can be complicated, they are possible. And uh, I know there's a lot of positions, obviously, basically what's been mentioned up here. They prefer that people within their faith obviously be you know, marrying someone within their faith because, especially when it comes to childbearing, they obviously pose to be some, you know, who, who is on the difficulty of one is not being you know, the same religion as the other or trying to force their kids to, you know, choose one religion over another. So. But I personally believe that it is possible to have you know, one person, whether you're a Christian and an atheist or a uh, uh, you know, Protestant, Catholic, or even Christian, Muslim, I know it would all be difficult at times. I do believe it is very possible for that to be the case. And so it's definitely not something that shouldn't occur. It's just something that you know, requires work in some of that. So we're going to take another question from the crown. I think we have one of you. And also, you know, there was one that had a question next time. Maybe that's one of the things that right now. Well, you are the speaker. I think this is a good idea to everybody, but I don't know if we all have the same answer. But um, has it ever occurred to any of you that you believe what you believe because you were raised in it? Because you're surrounded by it, not because. Feel like within you, not saying that's the case, but if that thought has ever occurred to you, what do you think about that? So we start with CMS this time? Okay. So, so, I understand that people are brought to the bridge because the parents are brought to the center. From our perspective, the God is supposed to be called. Even during the parents will be there to take the first. And it's outside of the religion. So, for whatever reason, God may designate your soul to be born Muslim, Christian, Jew, Hindu, Buddhist, whatever serve, whatever desire he has planned. Because he knows it's done. 
what serving as a purpose to you? Well, I was actually very scattered in my entire life. And so when I got into college, you know, I just kind of opened up my mind a little bit. I just put down my Catholic beliefs and I'm like, I still, when I go back home, I still go to my, my church I means that's fellowship to me. I mean, everyone there, I'm very connected with. Um, what was that part of the question? Like, well, if it doesn't apply to you, what do you think? What do you think about the the reason that religion is so popular is because people have great skin in it or because they actually believe it to be true in themselves with no prior technology? Yeah, I would say that. Well, me personally, it's fun. Sorry, I don't feel like it's fun. Sorry. I still feel it's fun. University Christian culture. That was my personal opinion, and I was talking about a different answer for a bunch of different Christians as well. Uh, I believe it does play a big role for everything. I really do think so. Uh, just, uh, uh, as a child, uh, since uh, you're not able to support to take care of yourself on your own, or depend on your parents, uh, do so, you know, raise you with those morals and values uh, probably Jesus. Uh, as we get older and mature, yes, uh, it, it is. It is actually kind of more dependent on uh, how many of you are walking up. Uh, the way I feel like I see it is uh, your salvation is not for what your parents think and your parents taught you, it's what your relationship with Jesus is. Does that make sense? Uh, first of all, great question. Um, I actually had this issue with uh, my life. You know, I grew up in a Mormon family, you know, very typical. I'm the ninth of 11 kids, so <laughs> all Mormons, and only one of them so far has left the church. You know, so. uh, but we, uh, I grew up, you know, being taught these things for my entire life, and around my senior year of high school, and then when I went out to college at BYU, I was seriously questioning what I believed. And, you know, I came back here after that, and, you know, took off from college for a while, and really took the time to figure out what I did believe. And I think that, you know, as far as it goes for other people in my faith, uh, we are asked in our in scriptures actually in the Book of Mormon at the very end it says, pray about these things and find out for yourself if they're true. So I do believe that, like me, other members have also found that it's true. Next up we have Hello. Um in the church community we are encouraged to question and there uh, comes a point in our lives, usually around far bottom and side is that the rabbi will probably ask you, do you want to be Jewish? Do you want this right now? Is this something, is this an intellectual decision? And if it's not an intellectual decision, if you feel pressured emotionally or spiritually, then let's wait. Let's step back. Let's have a look at it. And in fact, if adults uh, who make conscious decisions, or children, whoever, I don't love my children no matter what they, what they, they adopt, is that the community will always see them as a member of the Jewish family, even if they choose to become Christian or Muslim or whatever it may be. So this is it.
taste for certain ferments and things that Muslims might be still forbidden. Um, my sister is an outspoken agnostic, and I was, my mom was raised deep in the south of Brazil without any connection to mosques or her Muslim faith. Um, my connection to the faith is entirely an individual decision. Um, nobody who's older than me in my family made any sort of commitment to the faith before me. Uh, I have God to thank for that. Um, and that's, I mean, that's as much as it gets. I think that there is a misconception very often that the vast majority of religious people do so without question. I would be an agnostic faith myself, and I think it's not that anybody would disagree with that way. I think it's a very, very arrogant way of thinking to think that nobody else questions, that the only people that question are those who are secular. I think that we all go through a process of questioning and learning and acquiring knowledge that is essential to being deeply rooted in your faith. Um, that's right. oh. <laughs> Quick question for our president. Are we going to use until 8.30 or 9? We have the room until 9, so we can go for another 10, 15 minutes at the most. Okay, so we have time for like, one or two more questions. Yeah, we'll just take one more question. Yeah, we'll just take one more question. Yeah, we'll just take one more question. Yeah, we'll Protect it, and it is a 
really it's a moral obligation that we have to do everything we can to protect this land and it's like it's all natural. Sorry, can you take a question? Okay. Um, the question is, what is your group belief about environmental protection and sustainability and what is humanity's duty on that? Humanity what? Duty. Oh. So um, in Islam, we are held accountable for our actions, right? So we also have to believe that this nothing is ours. God owns everything, the earth, even our own body. So it's a moral obligation to take care of animals, to take care of the environment that we live on, because it's not ours. So we just gave it to us as a trust, and trust us to take care of it, and that's our duty. Whether you're not religious, right? Because our basic community is exactly to 
for each other without all the rest of it, right? So in Islam, the rule is that Islam better community, I feel. Like, for example, in our faith, we're it's all living towards a good church. We have to, you know, it's not a choice. And so with that, it makes people who originally would not have thought to do that to do it, you know? And good things, no matter what religion, you know, what you are, what ethnicity you're from, it's a good thing. You know, so if you're charity, that's a good thing. Health, no, that's a good thing. So generally, what I think all the religions would agree to be, you know, a good person. You know, just others the way you want to do that, that the group was saying. So, um, we, I mean, our reason for it is just as a force. You know, when you find it on your own, uh, the things you can do. I've seen this. So, as you know, selfless, I'm better servants of God. In fact, being a servant to God, it doesn't necessarily mean like having a master and slave relationship or something like that. God is perfect. He's a perfect friend, a perfect father, also a perfect master. He wants us to serve him so that he may reciprocate to us service as well. In other words, if you give like 1% to the Supreme God, he gives 1% back. Imagine if you give 100%, and the Lord of all creation gives 100% back. It's all just a loving action. To be selfish is to be loving towards everyone. Just as God does. To picture an egoistic society and to picture an altruist society, obviously we're not a good altruist society. I just want to say one thing after this. We have pear juice with no sugar added in it. More free. Another University of Christian culture. I think that example of selflessness comes from the record of Jesus Christ. Uh, he walked on this earth, he lived a perfect life, and suffered and died as, he, as if he was a horrible, broken, sinful man. He took on the sin of us and took on all of our transgressions and paid that price for us. Uh, that is the example that I would give uh, to someone who makes that question. So Jesus. Sorry, I'm not that? like Hickory, I'm just the answer to the question you said was Jesus. Like the reason, the selfless reason to do the religion was Jesus. Okay, that's not all the time we have. I think our goal would be to be like him, which is, which is hard. Okay, yeah, that's our goal. That's, yeah. So let's put it to the religious forum. Um, if you guys are talking, maybe you guys will stick around for a little bit to maybe answer some one-on-one -on -one questions for you. But um, before that, we get a big round of applause for everyone who came out. Introduce yourself and explain, um, you know, what went on today. Well, I'm Charles Duncan. I'm the president of the Secular Student Alliance here at UTSA. And basically, the purpose of this event was to basically show our uh, basically the diversity on campus. We have a lot of different religious groups, as was exemplified today. And it just gives a chance for people to come out, ask questions, and learn things about religious groups that they may not have otherwise known about. And just have a chance to have fun and uh, learn more, basically. Um, I'm Jacob Schmidt. I'm the vice president. I was the moderator for the event. Um, the main idea behind the event was to have a discussion and not a debate. Um, we wanted to give each group an equal amount of time to present their views. We didn't want it to be like a, like a back and forth of people yelling at each other. Um, because if we're talking about religion, that's going to happen if we just let everybody say what they want as much as they want. So that's why we had it set to a specific time, time limit. We enforced it for every group. Every group had to say what they had to say within the amount of, amount of time. And I think it was fair and it gave everyone a chance to say what they thought. Yeah, so you're happy with, were you happy with how it turned out tonight? I'm very happy, yes. Um, I thought it was very, I thought it was very civil. I didn't, I don't think 
like any you know negative questions were asked. I think everybody here was asking questions out of genuine interest to learn more about you know the other face that they really probably didn't know much if anything about before when they before they walked through the doors into this place. And so I thought it went pretty well in my opinion. I think just the fact that we got a, gr a crowd here to listen to a bunch of people talk about their religion, I think that's an accomplishment in and of itself. Because not many people want to just sit around and listen to what other people think. Uh, whether it's about politics, religion, it, it's a heated topic. Just getting people to come out and listen and not um, cause a whole scene because people disagree with them, that, I, I feel like that was an accomplishment in and of itself. And, and what, oh, are you going to say something? No, I was just sitting there. And where do you... Uh, where are, you, where are you hoping it goes from here? Most likely from here, uh, we would like to maybe hold more uh, events like this in the future, in, in upcoming academic semesters, or potentially maybe even host a, a debate, you know, between like a you know some type of religious apologist and a non non believer, such as an atheist or agnostic, or just continue doing events like this, you know, to basically inform students, you know, of the different, you know, the different views, the different opinions of religious people versus non-religious people, and basically just give them something to participate in and, you know, be a part of, even a part of the dialogue, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you notice, the title of the event was the first annual religious forum. Um, so we, we do intend to do this again. Um, hopefully next, next year we can get more groups out and uh, we can draw an even bigger crowd. Um, I was, for, for a first time event, we had a pretty big crowd and we had a lot of people who were, who were genuinely interested and asked genuinely interested questions. So um, for, for a first time, this was a great start, but I hope it gets bigger as the, as the years go on. Sure. It um, does, um, the Secular Student Alliance um, have a particular mission, like mission statement, is it, does it have anything to do with, let's say, civic engagement or encouraging dialogue or anything like that? Or? Yes, civic engagement and dialogue definitely are, uh, are like centerpieces to our mission, but our overall mission is to promote scientific literacy, the scientific values, uh, secular humanism, showing how we can be, you know, good, you know, and moral without religion, basically, and, you know, just showing how, you know, important it is to learn science, to learn about, you know, be educated and things like that, promoting, you know, activism and uh, just basically acceptance. And the big idea behind this is because in recent semesters, um, different religious groups have had pretty heated confrontations with each other, um, us included, and with other religious groups on campus. And we felt that there was really no need for this. We, we should be able to just talk to each other and be able to talk about what we believe and not be in each other's face and make a whole protest about it. So that was the idea behind this. Um, I think this is something that the school itself needed. Um, because because of how heated things have gotten recently between certain groups and I feel like just the fact that these groups were finally able to come together and discuss their and share their views on these different issues with an audience gathered who was willing to listen it was a great accomplishment and that that is kind of our mission goal is to is to not just encourage secularism but to encourage people to to learn about these other beliefs and to learn a why they choose to be secular rather than believe in all these other beliefs. Like, like you can't say, I don't believe in this, even though I don't know what any of this is. You, you, you have to know these other beliefs to be able to decide that you don't believe in them. So, I, I don't think you can be secular without, without having things like this. And another point is to show off the diversity of UTSA. It's a campus with obviously many different religious faiths, cultural backgrounds, people from literally all over the globe here. And so an event like this definitely helps to exemplify our diversity at a school such as this with over 30,000 you know, plus students. And so I think that's what, one reason having an event such as this is important here on campus. Okay, thank you very much. Thank that was you. great. Thank you.